There's a difference between sex and gender, right? In other words, a person's sex is what they're born with. A person's gender is a set of you know, characteristics that a society assigns to people. It's always changing. So, so if you have that understanding and that framework about, about gender, about masculinity, you think it's not inherent that men act a certain way, but there's these larger social structures that impact dramatically mm -hmm. how boys growing up and how parents raising them and how a culture you know, socializing boys defines manhood. A lot of people think they make these declarative statements like, you know, pink is a girl's color. You know, pink was a boy's color until the, in the, until the 19th century. High heels were a male fashion in the aristocratic, dresses, aristocratic robes, Europe. Skirts. Yes. Like the Miley Cyrus uh, performance at the uh, VMAs. The old paradigm is to look at Miley Cyrus and talk about what, is she a bad role model for girls and, and what is she doing and, 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 and focusing on her. Yet Robin Thicke is a 36 year old man who wrote the song that is incredibly sexist and sexually objectifying. The video that accompanies it incredibly sexually objectifying of women. And he's a 36 year old man scripted in, in a performance with a 20 year old and she's the one who gets blamed. What about him? What about his responsibility? When we talk about men and men acting badly, uh, it's not just individuals who somehow, you know, burst out on their own. It's like we're, there's, we're products of social system. My work is about redefining manhood so that the, the idea that power and control equates to manhood will not be so prevalent. What, what are your memories or feelings of, like, of your childhood that you feel pointed in the direction of what you're doing now? Um, I grew up in Boston in the, in the um, 60s and 70s. Um, I was a big football player. At the same time, I was publicly successful. I was privately had some challenges in my family and, and dysfunctional relationships all around me. And I grew up in a home with a, with, a, with, a, with a stepfather who was a really badly damaged human being and who, who was badly beaten down by his father, my step-grandfather. And my stepfather didn't have the skills, uh, to say the least, to stop the uh, pain, if you will, he passed it down to me and my siblings. But when you say that your stepdad was didn't have the tools, what tools didn't he have? He was emotionally illiterate. He was verbally very uh, uh, reticent. He was very uh, passive in the face of authority. But he was ex he would exercise his own authority, but passive in the face of authority over him. Uh, I never had a conversation with him about anything of substance like this. I, I was a a big you know. It, three-sport three varsity athlete from the earliest days, and my, my school was a real jockocracy, real football town. So I had the experience of knowing what it's like to be, in the, in a, if you will, in the center of the jock culture in a, in, a, in a positive way and got some of the benefits of that. It also helped me later in life um, to not be at all intimidated by men who present themselves as tough or strong. I was one of the few Jewish football players, so I, had, I was kind of a, a weird anomaly in that culture. Sometimes when you're an outsider, that gives you that observant sort of, you know, you're not oh, yeah. in quite as much. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, being Jewish was a part of my, a big part of my formative experience of understanding the world and marginalization and also victimization. Part of the sort of social justice foundation of my psyche mm -hmm. was, yeah, was being Jewish and knowing that, you know, silence in the face of injustice is, you know, is complicity and in injustice. Completely. And your mom, you no, know, what was her influence? She was a liberal, sort of feminist woman ahead of her time. When I was in college and I saw women standing up for themselves, speaking out, organizing, I, instead of being defensive in the face of that, I felt more like solidarity. Many men have led you know, emotionally stunted lives and, and in addition to what men do to women, what men do to other men. And power and control is the central factor underlying, for example, domestic violence and, ra and rape. If you believe that male children are born every bit as loving and every bit as caring as female and children with are. as strong a female side as a female has yeah, a male side. Yeah, I mean, they're human beings with, you know, empathy and concern and compassion. But what happens is as we socialize empathy out of boys. We define manhood as, you know, achieving power and competition and control over others and, and over yourself. And, 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 and as a result, you see this, the same loving little boy who's three years old is now 17 years old pushing his girlfriend up against a locker the mainstream of pornography that's marketed to men and boys is so misogynist and so anti-woman. A lot of that that you see in pornography is, is rape. It's sexual violence. If sex is not reciprocal, then it's not, to me, it's not the sex that we fought for in the sexual revolution. And so many young girls are being trained to service men's sexual needs, not to, uh, yeah. not to fulfill their own. Do you feel that it's, it's gone backwards? Oh, it has gone backwards. The automate, automation of the, and the for, of society in, in order, you know, to fulfill the corporate needs. That's created a certain formula and stereotype that's very backward. 
Yeah. So we yeah, have in a yeah, certain way yeah. like this, like a real evolution forward in one way, but in another right. way, this, a lot of the norms, it's, it's, it's way backwards. It's like uh, 50s. You know, in male culture, I, I talk a lot about what can men do who are not themselves abusive? Because most men will say, you know, I don't abuse women. I don't abuse my girlfriend or wife or wife or something. And so why should I care? What should I do? It's not my issue. And I say, yes, it is your issue, in part because we have a big problem in our society and, and we need more men to step up, but also because your interactions with your peers in the, in the, in the workplace or in school or in any other number of the situations helps to shape these social norms that it, can be, it becomes expected. Those of us men who are not happy with the behavior of some of us don't speak up and we don't make it clear to our friends that we don't accept that behavior or those beliefs, you know, about sex, sexist beliefs or homophobic or heterosexist beliefs or racist beliefs, then our silence is a form of consent and complicity. So I feel like in a way that's we're approaching a new, like we're in a new revolution right now. I think one of the reasons why you're this subject of men and violence and, you know, a lot of things are really super bubbling to the surface because we're in the midst of, of a new paradigm. You know, every time I get in an airplane and come into a big city, say like New York, you see this enormous city unfolding on, uh, you know, on, you know, out the window of an airplane. It's like millions and millions of people in these complex social systems. It's like, how are you going to change this? What, what people need to understand is that they think these norms are something that comes from God, like handed down like the Old Testament. Right, right. My colleagues work with men in all over the world. I find lots of men who are willing to have this conversation. They might come in a little defensive, but they are... Angry. Yeah. And I, and I see it every day. This is a fact, as far as I'm concerned.